Recently, Rush Limbaugh, the well-known conservative talk show personality, revealed to his audience that he had stage 4 lung cancer. That is a deadly serious diagnosis. Shortly after that announcement, he was honored by the President of the United States in a State of the Union address. Almost every American family knows the pain when a loved one is diagnosed with a serious illness. Here tonight is a special man, beloved by millions of Americans, who just received a stage four advanced cancer diagnosis. This is not good news, but what is good news is that he is the greatest fighter and winner that you will ever meet. Rush Limbaugh, thank you for your decades of tireless devotion to our country. In recognition of all that you have done for our nation, the millions of people a day that you speak to and that you inspire, and all of the incredible work that you have done for charity. I am proud to announce tonight that you will be receiving our country's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Rush had said earlier to his millions of listeners, so I have to tell you something today that I wish I didn't have to tell you. It's a struggle for me because I had to inform my staff earlier today, he said, I can't help but feel that I'm letting everybody down. The upshot is that I've been diagnosed with advanced lung cancer. Then he said, I told the staff today that I have a deeply personal relationship with God that I do not proselytize about. But I do, and I have been working on that relationship tremendously, Limbaugh said. His use of the word proselytize reminded me of a very powerful statement by atheist Penn Jillette of the famous magician pair Penn and Teller. We used the quote in our video, The Fool. This is what Penn Jillette said about proselytizing. And I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell, and people could be going to hell and not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think it's not worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward, and then he said this amazing statement. How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? If I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. Watch now what happens when I share the message of everlasting life with this young student. I don't believe in the Bible just because I think many people change verses. So what do I do to go to heaven? Let me ask you a question and see what you think of this. Do you know anything about Jesus? I do know some things. I'm not perfect. He was the most loving person that ever existed. When he was crucified, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He's the one that said, do to others as you'd have them do to you. But listen to what he said here, and I want you to tell me what it means. He said this, Unless you hate your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, and your own life, you cannot be my disciple. What did he mean by that? Mm, I have no idea. It's called hyperbole, when you contrast love with hate to make an emphasis. That's what he did. And the reason he did it is because the first and greatest commandment to you and to me and the whole world is to love God with heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. That's the first and greatest commandment, because God gave us life. And what he was saying is that your love and my love for God should be so great that compared to our love for mom and dad, brother and sister, and our own life should seem like hatred. Do you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and so love him that it makes every other love that you have seem like hate? I do love him. Do you love God? Yeah, but sometimes, you know, I go through things and sometimes I wonder if God is with me. So let me see how much you love God, okay? Have you ever used God's name in vain? I have, I'm not going to lie, I have. Would you use your mother's name as a cuss word? No. Why not? 
Because I do love her. And you wouldn't disrespect her by using her name as a cuss word. And yet that's what you've done with the name of God, the holy name of God, the one that gave you life. You took his name and used it in the place of a four-letter filter word to express disgust, which is called blasphemy, punishable by death in the Old Testament. So it seems that you don't love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Let's look at some of the other commandments to see how you're going to do on Judgment Day. How many lies do you think you've told in your life? That's the ninth commandment. I'm pretty sure I've told a lot. So what do you call someone who tells lies? A liar. Have you ever stolen something, even if it's small? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I have. What do you call someone who steals things? A stealer. A thief. A thief. So what are you? I guess I'm a thief. A lying thief. Yeah, a lying thief. Now Jesus said, if you look with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Have you ever looked with lust? Uh, maybe. Have you had sex before marriage? Yes, I have. So Jaylene, I'm not judging you, but you've just told me you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, fornicating, adulterer at heart. And you have to face God on Judgment Day. If he judges you by the Ten Commandments, we've looked at four, on Judgment Day, do you think you'd be innocent or guilty? I'd be guilty. Heaven or hell? Uh, I'd go, probably go to hell. How does that concern you? Um, I don't believe in the Bible just because I think many people change verses. I do think I'm a good person. Well, let me address those two or three things you brought up. I'm not trying to convince you to believe in the Bible. Yeah. I'm trying to convince you you're in terrible danger. Um, and to convince you that you're not a good person, you're a self-admitted, lying, thieving, fornicating, blasphemous, tolerant heart. And the problem is this, if I may say it, Jaylene, and thanks for your patience with me, is that you have your own standard of goodness. You think a lying thief is a good person, but when God speaks of good, he means moral perfection and thought, word, and deed. And none of us are morally perfect. Only Jesus was morally mm -hmm. perfect. So if you die in your sins, you've got God's promise, you'll end up in hell. That's what's going to happen after you die. God's given you the death sentence and after death the judgment. What were we going to say? So what do I do to go to heaven? That is the best question you can ever ask. You probably almost know. What did God do for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Do you know? Do you have to baptize yourself? No. God did something. Kill himself? Yeah, God became a human being, Jesus of Nazareth, and suffered and died on the cross. Now you know that, but you may not know this. The Ten Commandments are called the moral law. Yeah. You and I broke the law, Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on that cross. That's why he said, it is finished. In other words, the debt has been paid. Jaylene, if you're in court and someone pays you a fine, a judge can let you go even though you're guilty. You can say, Jaylene, there's a stack of speeding fines here, this is deadly serious, but someone's paid him, you can go. And he can do that which is legal and right and just. Even though you're guilty, he can let you walk because someone paid the fine. And God can let us walk on Judgment Day. He can let us live forever. He can take the death sentence off us because Jesus paid the fine in his life's blood. Yeah. You make, does that make sense to you? A little bit. So what exactly would I have to do to, you know, go to heaven? We broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. Then he rose from the dead and defeated death. And all you have to do to find everlasting life is repent of your sins. Don't just confess them. Repent of them. Repentance is where you say, I'm a Christian, and you stop lying and stealing and blaspheming and fornicating. Oh. That's just playing the hypocrite, deceiving yourself. So your, your repentance must be sincere to be genuine. And then trust in Jesus like you trust a parachute. I'm going to ask you an interesting question. If I put you on the edge of a cliff a thousand feet up with your toes over the edge, and you can feel the stones crumbling beneath your feet, and a thousand feet below there are jagged rocks, would that be fearful for you? Um, yeah. No. Terrifying. Yeah, it would be terrifying. Would yeah. the feeling of fear be good or bad? It would be bad. Very would the, bad. Very bad. Would the fear itself be good or bad? Not good. I don't think anyone likes fear. No, the fear would be good. You know why? Why? It's telling you move back from the cliff. You're in danger. Back up, back up. So that fear is your friend, not your enemy. And what I've tried to do today is put your toes over the edges of eternity and show you that it's fearful. If you die in your sins and you stand before God and he judges you, that's a fearful thing. But see that fear is your friend, not your enemy. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and through the fear of the Lord men depart from evil. And the only way you're going to repent and trust the Savior is if you can see your danger. And I'm trying to say, Jaylene, you're in terrible danger. Get right with God. Repent. Put your faith in Jesus. And the second you do that, You've got God's promise. He'll grant you everlasting life as a free gift. 
You can walk out of his courtroom all because of what Jesus did on that cross. Does that make sense? Yeah, I do understand now. So you're going to think about what we talked about? I am actually going to think about it, yeah. You're going to get right with the Lord? Yeah. When? Now. May I pray with you? Sure. Father, I pray for Jaylee, and I thank you for her open heart and her honesty before you, and I pray today she'll see sin in its true light, that it's deadly serious, and find a place of sorrow, true repentance, and faith in Jesus, and pass from death to life because of your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the Evidence Bible, everything you'd ever want to know about evangelism. It's over 1,800 pages, filled to overflowing with apologetical arguments, everything you'd ever want to know about reaching the lost. It's available at livingwaters.com, amazon.com, or at your Christian bookstore.